planes, trains, and automobiles? What's in the Infrastructure Act for New Jersey? This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and welcome to the Issues Watch podcast. With all the drama over the Build Back Better legislation in Washington, people seem to have already forgotten about the $1.2 trillion drama that ended in November. That drama was the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, a multi-chapter saga in and of itself. This law, which barely squeaked by in Congress, is bringing to New Jersey more than $12 billion in federal aid to be used for infrastructure projects. Our guest today to discuss what this package means for New Jersey is prominent Washington lobbyist Rob Zucker, a partner with Winning Strategy and a New Jersey native. Welcome, Rob. Great to have you back. Thank you very much. It's uh, an interesting time of year, interesting uh, time to be in Washington, and glad to get to talk about it with you and your listeners. Yeah, and we're, we're glad to have you because it sure as heck has been an interesting uh, few months, and it looks like it's going to remain that way for another few months. So I know you lobbied for the bipartisan infrastructure law. From a national perspective, can you give us an overview of what's in the law? Uh, I'll be glad to. And I think people might have heard about this under various names. Uh, Congress called it the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or IIJA acronym. But in most of what the Biden administration is communicating as it's implementing and putting a lot of these dollars on the street related to the law, they're referring to it as the bipartisan infrastructure law, like you just mentioned. Um, it was enacted on November 15th. And it's, uh, it has 973 billion over five years um, related to what we would normally have considered until this year, hard infrastructure, things like roads, bridges, transit, rail, um, even our aviation system. And then it has another $266 billion approximately of this additional above the baseline funding um, for things that relate to water and sewer, and broadband, um, the electrical grid, uh, and resilience. So, you know, I think that uh, useful ways of thinking about it include that even though the overall measure is 973 billion, there's $500 billion in what's new investment above the baseline. Transportation makes up about $284 billion of it. Um, water and sewer is going to comprise about $55 billion of it additional investment, broadband 65 billion, the energy grid and power related investments, uh, $73 billion. Um, although it's not the card of the country that we talk about usually, Western water infrastructure is slated for about $8.3 billion and resilience uh, writ large uh, across the country is slated for a $46 billion investment. I recall Tony Kosha, the former chair of the Port Authority, saying, and this was many years ago, that America's infrastructure compared to Western Europe is a joke. Is that still true? If it is, why did it take Congress decades to act? Whether or not um, our infrastructure is a joke in comparison to Western Europe, and I, uh, you know, I agree with you. I think Tony Kosha is one of the foremost experts and uh, on transportation and would have just almost a unique perspective to offer on it. Um, I think that other countries have been updating their infrastructure all along or have been making significant investments along the way that the United States hasn't in, in recent years. Um, I think that it's very important, going back to your prior question for just a second, to think about why this new money is so important is that if we've been relying, which I, um, I alluded to a few minutes ago, if we've been relying on the gas tax uh, to pay for our infrastructure investments across the United States. Um, there has not been an uh, increase in the federal gas tax since 1993. Wow. So that means that there's been no additional acceleration of funding um, to resolve or allocate substantial federal resources to infrastructure in quite some time. 
how much does New Jersey stand to receive from this act? And what's the breakdown of key aspects of funding that our listeners should know about? Senators Menendez and Booker uh, have put out estimates that I think that I feel the most comfortable relying upon right now. Um, for transportation programs, uh, and according to the formulas out there, um, they say that there's about $12.3 billion in the offing for New Jersey, um, roads, bridges, and other networks. Um, there's additional money that would be no less than $100 million for broadband. But I think when you think of that more traditional infrastructure, and this is just portions of it, uh, highways in New Jersey are slated for about $6.8 billion, bridges for $1.1 billion, electric vehicles pegged at $104 million, ferries, we do have ferries and we rely on them, not every state in the country does, but $24 million in investment, um, $4 billion plus uh, for transit. And that's not just the Gateway Project, but that's things like the Portal Bridge and Portal North and South Bridges, extending the Hudson Bergen Light Rail finally to Bergen uh, County, because um, it's been almost entirely Hudson over the, over the years, uh, and extending it to the west side of Jersey City, um, making changes in our bus fleet so that there's zero emission vehicles, and modernizing the network of rail and, and bus stations um, as well. I think that when I was speaking of some of the broader categories, Earlier in our discussion, I mentioned the large scale investments in uh, clean water, both drinking water and um, sanitary sewer. And uh, EPA, you know, just released its first years of estimated funding for fiscal year 22 for all 50 states. And New Jersey, under these are the programs that would replace lead service lines, for instance, um, were pegged at $168.9 million. Uh, flowing from the federal government to the state revolving funds that would finance water infrastructure just in the first year. And then I think that um, there's a whole number of other programs that are invested in where New Jersey stands to do disproportionately well. Um, New Jersey, over the years, having worked in the New Jersey congressional delegation for Senator Frank Lautenberg, for Congressman Steve Rothman, um, you know, obviously there's always a concern whether New Jersey gets its return on the federal dollar that it pays in through taxes. And I think that there's general agreement that transportation sector is one of the places that New Jersey does disproportionately well when it comes to the return on the dollar. But I think people should keep a real close eye on uh, the investments in renewable energy, uh, especially in uh, wind power. Um, I think that New Jersey has a real opportunity uh, to again, you know, benefit disproportionately from that those federal dollars that flow, and I think that it's a really interesting discussion um, and story. Why, um, you know, the state of New Jersey is working extremely hard uh, to, as they say, put metal in the water, right, um, to get turbines set up off the coast that would start generating electricity. But it's going further than that. It's it's developing a new wind port down in Salem County. Um, it's investing in training a labor force that could be ready to manufacture um, these turbines and the components that go into them that install those turbines and then maintain them. And I think because of the leap um, and the investment and the leadership role that the state has been working really hard to establish these last many years, um, it stands to reap the benefits disproportionately, not just for wind that's located off of the Jersey coast, but across the Eastern seaboard. So I think that there's a real, uh, a real great opportunity that stands there for the state. And also just note that there's another um, estimated $3.5 billion uh, for flood mitigation assistance grants over five years that given all of the communities in New Jersey along the shore and along the many communities that are affected by rivers and streams that are at risk from tidal or storm related flooding, um, this mitigation, I think, is particularly important to addressing the current and growing urgency of providing protection from flooding, uh, especially as storms either become uh, more intense or more frequent uh, related to a change in climate. Thanks, Rob. So now here's one that's uh, something I'm always thinking about, very important to me, since I live only 15 miles from New York City, but it takes forever to get in there. Uh, and that is, uh, how much money is in the act for the Gateway Tunnel Project? And do you have any idea 
when we'll see the first new tunnel that I can take to get into New York City. Um, I haven't seen a reliable estimate on when you'll be able to ride a train through one of the new tunnels yet. Um, there have been enough delays related to the project, the prior version of the project being canceled, and then, you know, frankly, the antipathy of the Trump administration uh, toward any steps that New York and New Jersey were attempting to take to revive it. Um, there's $30 billion uh, dedicated to investment in Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, um, plus another $8 billion in a supplemental appropriation that people on Capitol Hill um, indicate are, are all funds eligible to be spent on the Gateway Project. I mean, I think that that new tunnel is as much about increasing capacity, so to, to, to make your commute either more reliable or more safe and quick, as it is about resilience, you know, heaven forfend, that something happened to the existing tunnel, you know, like another storm, another, another Sandy related storm of that scope where there's serious damage done and it accelerates the erosion and decay of the existing uh, tubes that we have under the Hudson River. So I think that, I think that this is a godsend if you care about the Gateway Project. Um, it is going to make very large scale investments in those tunnels, but also in the other choke points, such as those bridges along the way um, that are other that, you know, that otherwise make uh, the northeast corner uh, corridor vulnerable um, over the next several decades due to aging infrastructure. <laughs> so, do economists believe that all this infrastructure spending will have a significant impact on the economy? I think they do. Uh, I think there's actually pretty broad agreement that um, investment along the scale and for the reasons uh, that I've delineated is gonna positively benefit the economy. But I think it's really important to understand that this, um, this bill is not intended as stimulus. It's very different than the, uh, when a lot of the people talked about projects that would be shovel ready that were passed as part of the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, that was in the wake of the financial meltdown in 2008. And that was very much intended to stimulate the economy to get things jump started while also addressing, you know, large scale national and regional uh, priorities for infrastructure investment. This one really is intended um, to have a slower burn. Um, I think that it's intended to be generational. It's certainly believed that it will yield um, enhancements and American uh, competitiveness. Um, I think that the investments that are gonna be made in things like the electrical grid, uh, like wind and solar are, are overdue, the shift to electrical vehicles. I mean, we have private, you know, the private companies that are manufacturing cars uh, are already announcing that they're gonna phase out, you know, uh, vehicles with internal combustion engines coming over the course of the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, there, you know, as a country, I think we are um, facing, and I think this is uh, likely to be a tremendous opportunity for many, um, a shift to electrical vehicles, whether the kind of vehicles that you and I might drive or the medium and heavy duty vehicles that are needed to bring freight across, you know, our country. Um, you know, we need to, I think that this legislation uh, and the multi-year investment in the infrastructure, for instance, in charging those vehicles, both you know, both vehicles that you or my, I might own, as well as those you know heavier duty vehicles, um, those send signals to the private sector that that the investments that they're making in those shifts are worthwhile. I think similarly about offshore wind or terrestrial wind um, or batteries um, that would be able to store energy produced from wind in kind of next, next generation technology. So when wind isn't blowing, that money, uh, excuse me, that energy can be pushed back into the grid. Um, I think that those are gonna be signals to the private sector that by and large is making those shifts, um, but those investments are worthwhile. So I think, that, I think that we are on the cusp of seeing some tremendous changes. I don't think that economists are predicting that will yield a benefit, for instance, to GDP already in calendar year 22 or calendar year 23. But I think that they, they recognize that once those investments um, have been deployed and put in the field, um, that there's gonna be a lot of benefits to be reaped in the years ahead. Okay, so let's 
talk taxes for a moment. Uh, are there any significant tax changes in the act? I think there are some. I think that, that people would be familiar with the employee retention tax credit that was put in place um, as part of uh, the pandemic uh, relief bills known as the CARES Act last year. Um, this legislation uh, terminates somewhat earlier than expected the ERTC. So that's something to keep uh, an eye on and be aware of for some of your um, listeners. Um, there's provisions to extend Superfund taxes, to allow private activity bonds to be used for broadband infrastructure and carbon dioxide uh, capture facilities. But for the most part, I think that um, uh, one of, you can think of it that one of the price tags of securing that bipartisan uh, buy-in to this legislation was no significant changes in the tax code. At the outset, I think Democrats had talked and expected, um, including last, you know, in 2020 on the campaign trail, about rolling back in part or whole aspects of the 2017 Trump tax cuts. And I think that Republicans, especially in the Senate, signaled very early and then often that that was a non-starter for them. So I think, I think that that combined with the reluctance of Senator Manchin of West Virginia and Senator Sinema of Arizona, two of the 50 Democrats that were needed just to bring you know, all of the Democratic caucus along meant uh, no significant changes in the tax code, no rollbacks, no changes to the marginal rates, no new wealth taxes, no changes in carried interest, all of which were talked about really broadly, both by uh, then uh, nominee Joe Biden, as well as the rest of the field in the Democratic Party that was vying uh, to run against President Trump. Okay, well, that's a good lead into this. Uh, as you can imagine, with all the tax provisions that are uh, in the Build Back Better bill, uh, even if they were removed from the combined bill, you know, that bill and, and the infrastructure that at one time looked like they might move together, that bill, the Build Back Better, does have a ton of tax provisions. So you might imagine our members, you know, many of whom are tax experts, are keenly interested in whether it will pass, and if it does, what the final package might look like. I mean, right now, they're literally on um, pins and needles. Uh, so any quick thoughts on its prospects, that is the Build Back Better bill? Well, I think that for the overall package, and then I'll talk about its contents, you know, at least you know, things that I think are especially of concern in a moment. I think for the overall package that President Biden and congressional Democrats have invested just too much time and energy um, into passing something. You know, a lot of people are looking at the Build Back Better bill as the human infrastructure um, component to complement the, uh, the hard infrastructure, the roads build, roads, bridges, rail, electrical grid, et cetera. And in fact, you know, on Capitol Hill, they were twinned uh, for many parts of their negotiation because, you know, for, for a significant chunk of the Democratic caucus in either the House or Senate, um, these investments in human infrastructure are just as overdue and just as urgent to them. And that's part of what they signed up for when they agreed to vote for the hard infrastructure uh, law, you know, bill that became law in mid-November. So I think that there's so much invested right now uh, in terms of time and energy and reputationally that um, from a practical standpoint, they, let, they, can't, they simply can't let it collapse under its own weight. I think that might mean, however, um, that they have to contemplate scaling it back um, significantly and in additional ways. Um, it's already been scaled back from some of the members that wanted a $3 trillion package. We're not going to see a $3 trillion package. Um, a lot of people contemplate that it might be more in the neighborhood of $1 trillion in terms of investment. Um, I think they have to pass something and then you know, are resolved to go and campaign hard in advance of the 2022 midterm elections to educate people what was in it and why it was so important to them. I think for New Jersey, um, the changes in the cap on the salt deduction are particularly critical and are being watched um, by regular people in terms of how they are able to um, bear the property tax burden and the income tax burden of being a New Jersey resident. Um, the House bill passed a measure uh, that several members of the New Jersey congressional delegation, most notably 
uh, Congressman Malinowski, Congresswoman Cheryl, uh, Congressman Gottheimer, and obviously on the Senate side, Senator Menendez and Senator Booker have been really advocating on um, that would that would more straightforwardly increase the cap to eighty thousand um, dollars. Interestingly, because of budget gymnastics and the procedures they would need uh, to go through to make sure that it's offset and paid for, um, the salt cap that, that as low as ten thousand dollars a year under the Trump tax cuts is set to expire in just a couple of tax years. At which point the status quo before the Trump tax cuts would have returned. Um, this utilizes that fact from a budgetary standpoint and allows it to be increased as high as 80 before snapping back at a later time in the budget window back down to 10 to be able to say that it's paid for. That does not meet muster with a lot of senators. Um, Senator Bernie Sanders has said that this particular um, tax form of tax relief is uh, benefits too many high income people to make him comfortable. He is the he is the chair of the Senate Budget Committee and obviously one of the most progressive members of the Senate. Notwithstanding the fact that in 2017, Republicans uh, on both you know in both the House and Senate were aware of the implications of putting this cap in place that it would disproportionately affect people in coastal states, especially ones like New Jersey, like New York, like California. Um, that tend to elect Democrats. They're very comfortable putting it in place there. I think that Democrats here are resolved that even though it may be true that people at higher incomes will benefit more, that they're just not gonna, they're not gonna take it lying down. They're, they're, they are resolved to do something to provide relief from their constituents who paid a price in 2017 and to give them a measure of relief. Um, Senator Menendez is leading the way on that negotiation in the Senate. And um, I just can't see a, pa a, a path really, I can't envision a path where uh, some substantial relief from the salt cap is not put in place in order to win the votes, both of uh, uh, New Jersey's two senators in the Senate, let alone on any package that will come back before the House before it could become law. Well, that's good to hear. Um, I mean, that they might raise the ceiling. Uh, by the way, what, um, you have any sense of, uh, although I know it's going to happen in the future, you have any sense or guesses as to whether or not more than just a handful of re Republicans in the House and Senate would support such a bill, even if it's slimmed down? Um, actually, uh, no Republicans are, are, are anticipated to support it. Um, it would, uh, the procedurally, it uses, uh, Democrats would have to turn to a procedure to stop the filibuster known as reconciliation, same procedure that was used to pass the 2017 Trump tax cuts without any Democratic votes, um, because those were controversial at the time uh, for Democrats. So at this point, I believe that uh, no Republicans uh, in the House were willing to pass the House version of the bill. Um, no Republicans in the Senate are willing uh, to, uh, to support the package that is being contemplated. And that's why really when you hear uh, about negotiations, when you read about them in the newspaper, when you watch programs about them on television uh, with respect to the Build Back Better package, it's negotiations between Democrats, not right, between right. Democrats and Republicans. Wow, yeah, that's true. Um, I guess, you know, you were right. The, the the partisan war in Washington is like something I've never seen. It makes the days of the uh, Tea Party look like nothing. Uh, any thoughts about when such a package uh, might pass? I think, uh, especially uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer was really pushing as hard as he could to get it done before the end of the year. It's looking less likely that that's a possibility as of today when we're taping on December 13th. Um, I think that there is the, the, the greatest likelihood that this will roll over back into early calendar year 2022. Um, but I think that the same way that Democrats showed a sense of urgency in really resolving after the November elections in 2021, um, in Virginia and New Jersey to, to you know, get off the dime and, and enact the, trend, the hard infrastructure law. I think that a lot of Democrats uh, in the House and Senate are resolved to wrap up a package on something very early in the year 
so they can really spend much more time um, on educating people about uh, the many provisions in it that they think are going to improve the lives of regular Americans and make that case over the course of the next uh, year until the 2022 midterm elections. You know, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it was the off-year elections that really got the infrastructure bill moving because that thing was just like a football going back and forth for a long time. And like you said, between within the Democratic Party, forget about the Republicans. So, Rob, thank you again for joining us. It's always uh, great to have you on. I know this is probably like the fourth time we've had you on over the last few years. And I, I promise you that I am going to get you again. You're my main man in Washington, so you're not, you're definitely on the hook here. Well, always glad to talk with you and your audience. And I think it's been a really interesting time. Um, obviously, a lot of people are very actively involved <laughs> in advocacy down here in Washington because there's so much at stake. I think that we'll see a lot more of that um, heading into 2022, and I'll be glad to share whatever insights I can. So I appreciate it and hope you have a lovely holiday season. Thanks, Rob. You too. Thanks for listening and watching. The Issues Watch podcast will be taking a short break for the holidays. We'll be back with new episodes starting January 11th. And Happy New Year to everyone.